Hi, it's Thursday, June 20th, and I continue to read and wonder my way through Luke's Gospel. And today we're in Luke chapter 26, verses 36 to 43. Um, yesterday, we uh, we finished up the story of the road to Emmaus. Right? Jesus was with Cleopas and Cleopas' companion, I think wife. Um, so Jesus was walking with them. They didn't know who he was. They invited him into their home. Um uh, instead of letting him go on the journey on his own and, and, and fed him. And in the blessing, the breaking of the bread, they suddenly recognized who Jesus was and then he disappeared. And their hearts burned as they thought of how Jesus had revealed himself to them in the scriptures and all of that stuff. And Cleopas and the missus decide to go back to tell the others what had happened. So this is Luke's first um, resurrection story. And, uh, and Luke has two. And so I'm, we're going to tell the second one, and much like the road to Emmaus, I'm going to cut it in half. So it's pretty short today. Luke 24, verses 36 to 43. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he take it. He took it and ate it in their presence. So here we go. Luke's second resurrection story. Um, Cleopas and the other have gone back to the other to, uh, Cleopas and his partner let's do that uh, have gone back to the others to tell them how they met Jesus and while they're telling them and they're hearing about how, how, how Peter met and all they're all talking about it that's where this starts while they were talking about this they're talking about the resurrection stories um, Jesus appears now it, it sounds a little bit like his appearance um, as told in John's gospel which was written after Luke and, and may well have lifted some details from Luke. Who knows? Um, but just the idea of the hands and the feet and also just being there and, and bringing peace. Um, in, in one, you know, gospel breathes um, the spirit upon them. But this whole idea is that there, there, there's a peace that comes um, and, and a recognition that it's Jesus. What really stands out in Luke's gospel, for me anyway, is that Luke wants us to have no doubts. This is a... Jesus is um, a fully resurrected human being. This is a physical resurrection. This is not a spiritual resurrection. Um, and, and it's a little tricky at times because, again, Cleopas and, and, and partner walked with Jesus and didn't recognize him. So that doesn't sound like a physical resurrection, does it? Um, but then Jesus appears, and now you can recognize him. And in fact, Cleopas and, and partner could recognize him at dinner too. So he is able to change, it would seem. And so if he's changing, that doesn't sound human like you and me. We, we tend to look the same, right? Uh, we're recognizable. Um, now, it might be that those around Jesus couldn't recognize him. Um, and again, it depends on whether you want this to be uh, historical or metaphorical. Um, you know, and it might be they don't recognize him because they're not expecting to see the living Christ because they haven't opened their hearts to see the living Christ. Um, they're still focusing on the dead Jesus on the cross. So until they are able to make that transition, that is to believe in life, even as much as they believe in death, then they can't see. And I know that seems a bit far-fetched, but when you, when you think about the way we experience, express, and share faith, very often I, I hear faith um, shared on the basis of, of, of death, actually. You want to believe in your faith. You want to believe in Jesus. You want to be part of the church so that when you die, you go to heaven. That, to me, seems to be a death um, focused faith. Um, you want to do all the right things, belong to a church, I'll do all, you know, do, do, do God's will so that you won't be punished and sent to hell. That again seems to me like a death focused faith, not a living focused faith. 
So what if what Luke is trying to point out to us is that we can't really see Jesus until we begin to believe in life. To, till we believe in a living God, not a dead Jesus. And, you know, and I, and I appreciate the work that a lot of fantastic biblical scholars have done. And, of course, it's all speculative, but, you know, you can get um, the Jesus Seminar. Uh, years ago, published, published uh, a red-letter Bible. Um, so the Jesus Seminar were, were biblical scholars and theologians from all over the world. And there are hundreds of them. And what they do is they go through the Bible, um, through, the, through the Gospels, and they would read them, and then they would bring their various critical um, skills to the fore and would decide, did Jesus say that? And so you get red ones where everybody primarily completely agreed. Like it's 90%, yeah, Jesus said and did that. And then you'd have pink where it's like, maybe he did. Most of us think so, but not all of us. Um, pink, red. Then you had gray, which is most of us don't think that it's likely. No, most of us don't think so. And then there was black saying, no, none of us or virtually none of us think that these are the authentic words of Jesus um, or actions or anything. And it's fascinating to read. I mean, I, and, and, and I've enjoyed reading it. Um, but knowing whether a lot of scholars and experts think that Jesus actually said these words or not is not nearly as helpful to me as my experience in my own life when I have adopted those words or trusted those words. You know, when Jesus says, turn the other cheek, even if all the scholars of the world said Jesus would never have said that, my experience of turning the other cheek has been rewarding personally and, 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 and faithfully. And so I believe in the power of those words. Um, I mean, I'm picking a very simple example that I don't have to go into too much, but, but you know, it's, it's the experience. And, and I would say in my defense, whether, and by the way, the majority of scholars do believe that Jesus said that, um, turn the other cheek. But if they didn't, I would still say, yeah, but my, my faith is not based on dead Jesus. My faith is informed by a living God why I read scripture this way, why I take it and wonder about it. I want that living God to speak to me. I, I want to I wanna go beyond what might, might have happened historically. I want to have a sense of what's happening now. What God, what's God saying now? So when I read this story, um, I, I hear of Jesus appearing um, as if surprised, like they didn't expect him to come um, because they were talking about Jesus. Because they were... They were uh, sharing their experiences, and then Jesus is present and suddenly present, right? Um, just seems to be there. They didn't see him approach. They didn't, you know. Uh, I, I mean, in John's gospel and others, it's quite clear that he, he gets through locked doors, um, but 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 he goes to them. So I read this story. And go, yeah. So the thing is that Jesus is with us when we're talking about him, when we're wondering about our faith, whether we're on the road uh, to get away on the road to go home, or whether we're gathered um, in, in, a, in a special place, in a holy place like a church, or where we're just gathered around an event. When we speak Jesus' name, Jesus is present. I have a friend, and that's actually what's really important to him. Uh, he prays a lot um, because his relationship with God is very important to him and how he lives and manages his life. He says, there are times where I don't even know what I'm going to do or what I'm going to say. I'm not even sure why. I just need to say Jesus' name. And I say his name, and I feel open to his presence. I know that sounds a little mystical, magical for some people, but it's for him that simple. And I hear Luke doing that same thing. They're talking about Jesus, and guess what? Jesus is there. Cleopas and his partner were talking about Jesus. Jesus appeared on the road with them. Cleopas and his partner go to tell the others and they're sharing their stories. Simon Peter saw this, we saw that, and Jesus is with them. When we talk about Jesus, when we talk about our faith, our faith comes alive and we move from a dead Jesus to a living God. I believe that Luke wants us to understand that. But I also, Luke, also think that Luke very much wants us to understand that this is a physical resurrection. Because there would have been people back then who did not believe it to be a physical resurrection. They would have said that um, that, that bodily resurrection 
Um, no, that's not what happened. That um, that he ra- that he was raised from from the dead spiritually, which is why you can't recognize him and why he tells Mary, "Don't touch me, you know, don't hold on to me." That's again in John's Gospel. But it, it, it's and and how he appears in many places. At the same time, how does he get from Emmaus to Jerusalem to all these things? I mean, well, here he could have if Cleopas and the and the and the, uh, and the missus could get all the way there. So could Jesus, but they would have noticed him following, right? And you take all the resurrection stories, and it appears that Jesus keeps popping up in different places, and that's not the way that our physical world works. So it's easy to go, oh, so he's turned into something else. It's like a ghost. And then there are others who who firmly believe that. That the the uh, the followers' faith was so strong that when Jesus died, the way they kept talking about him and tried to follow all that he had taught them, it was as if Jesus was still there with them, as if Jesus was alive in the community. For some people, that's a resurrection. Not Luke. <laughs> Luke wants you to know. He puts the words in Jesus' mouth. Right? Why are you frightened? Why do doubts arise in your heart? Look at my hands and my feet. It's me. Touch me, right? So he doesn't, John, touch me. Well, here he is. Look. And then, give me something to eat. And he ate the fish in their presence. So Luke is telling us there are witnesses to people who are who have seen a physical Jesus. A, vi- a Jesus who is hungry. A Jesus who eats. It's not some kind of ghost, you know, where the fish goes into his mouth and just falls to the ground because there's no corporal body to hold it up. Um, it's just an illusion. It's not that at all. This is a physical resurrection and a bodily resurrection. And of that, Luke is convinced. Not all Christians that at the time were, and there are Christians today who um, are also not convinced of a bodily resurrection. And within my own community, um, I don't know what the split would be, you know, in terms of percentages, but a great number of people in my congregation absolutely do not believe in a bodily resurrection. A great number of my colleagues do not believe in a bodily resurrection. I do. Um, That's my choice. It's where my faith has taken me. I believe in a bodily resurrection because that body is important. Um, I believe that God loves my humanity and that God longs to be, has always longed to be with humanity. Hence, Jesus, from the beginning of time, there has been Jesus. Um, and uh, to be manifest in physical form, to, to be God with us. God wants to be with us. That means to me that God uh, doesn't disdain my human body. Uh, and Jesus doesn't cast it aside when he, when he is resurrected. He doesn't cast it aside like, like Clark Kent's glasses and suit when he becomes Superman. Look, I'm no longer pretending. I'm actually being who I am, right? No, Jesus doesn't pretend to be human. It's not a suit of clothes that God puts on so that God can be with us and see what we're doing, right? This is not you know, the prince and the pauper. This is not, you know, the good king who dresses up as a beggar and goes among the village villagers for a few days just to see what's really going on. That's not what this is. Part of God's creation, part of God's intent, part of God's plan is that, is that divine human connection. And it's a very um, important intentional connection. And there may come a time when I'm thinking, well, maybe it's not, you know, is it maybe I maybe I'm, maybe God's as connected to the deer and to the puppies as as God is connected to 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 me and, and, and human beings. But I think that there is something about the divine human relationship that is cherished um, by God. And and so it's important for the bodily resurrection so that we understand that God is not rejecting any part of our humanity. That's what I take from it, anyway. Um, also, to see, you know, and it's in other in other resurrection stories too. But when Jesus shows his his his, his hands and his feet, you can see the wounds. That's the other piece of this. That that yes, Jesus is resurrected. The divine Jesus is fully visible. As soon as you open your heart, stuff is fully visible, and yet that does not take away the wounds. The 
and and we can see that in a tragic way. Oh man, you're always going to have that scar. But the positive of that is that human beings impact God in um, an enduring way. I mean, I'm not glad that Jesus is scarred in his nail holes and his hands. No, absolutely not. But it does indicate that that I matter to God in that I affect God. We as human beings did a thing, the scar from which God continues to carry in the risen Christ. If you remember, um, uh, <laughs> just blanking on Israel's name for a minute, uh, Jacob r r wrestling with, with, with the angel. Um, and, and he wins and he walks away with a limp. So he has received God's blessing. He has engaged fully with God. Uh, and, and it will, it goes on to be Israel. They, I mean, he, he, he is the, uh, yes, Abraham, but, but yes, Jacob is, is, is the father of, of, of the tribes. Um, but he always bears a limp. And God is with us. But in Jesus we see, but those scars remain. Um, you matter to me if I carry your mark upon me. Um, whether that's a scar um, from pain or a mark of love, whatever it may be, you matter to me. And so showing those the scars to me is a sign that we matter to God. We have an effect on God. God is not untouched by our actions, not unmoved, therefore, also by our prayers or by our plight. Today, you know, when we sit in the middle of, 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 of climate chaos and we're not sure what to do, it's easy to imagine a God who sits back going like, well, you, you certainly messed that up. So uh, you made your bed, you're going to lie in it um, and just detach and be distant and just watch us um, hurtle toward oblivion. Yeah, we could see that. Except that we also affect God. Jesus bore the scars. Uh, I think that God is also scarred by what we do and uh, with the environment and creation. And God is involved and present, bearing the scars, but also leading us on, you know, taking us forward uh, to where there is life because my faith is in a living God, not in a dead Jesus. My faith is in a living faith, not in one that is bound by old rules, regulations, and, 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 and stories. Um, no, the stories continue to speak to the present, and the present continues to inform those stories. And in that mid, midst, it midst, in the midst of all that, I recognize God's presence. I can tell that I'm starting to, uh, to ramble. So you know what? I'm going to wrap it there and just leave it with you and see what, what, is, what does it mean to you. Think about this a little bit, and, and we'll finish off this story um, tomorrow, in fact, we'll finish off the gospel. And uh, that means Monday I'm going to be starting and I'm getting um, calls from people for both numbers and Revelation. So it isn't a clear-cut winner yet. So if you have a thought about Monday, whether we should start on the book of Revelation or the fourth book of the Torah, uh, book of Numbers, um, let me know. And uh, I'm probably going to surprise you on Monday because I'll make up my mind likely on Sunday. <laughs> but uh, let me know your thoughts. Anyway, um, let me just offer a prayer. Loving God, thank you for your presence and the truth that what we do affects you, matters to you. You are changed because of us. God, let this time of wondering be a time when we are changed by you as we hear your voice emerge in our wondering. May we be drawn to that voice and may we grow in faith. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that's enough for me today, but I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Until I get to see you, God bless you. Please know that God sees you, knows you, and loves you exactly where you are, exactly as you are. But God's love doesn't just stay with you. It actually moves through you into the world. That's what it is to be blessed. You are blessed and you are a blessing. You are a conduit of that grace, of that blessing. And so thank you for being you. And uh, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. God bless.